Okay. Good evening. Um, great. Again, a very good show. Courtesy you guys who are here to fill the auditorium and learn things. And thankfully, very Srinivas is still sitting there. So it's, it's, I mean, we can boast that even in North India, people are as keen about gaining knowledge as in South India. And we are, uh, courtesy Dr. Google, we are matching their standards in terms of education. Five day course, I think today is Saturday and everybody is wide awake. Although my task as Dr. Govil just defined when I was entering the theater is slightly difficult. Uh, his claim was jalebis were excellent. So my talk has to be slightly better than that for that uh, you are with me. And I have a conflict of interest, so I'd like to announce them first. I'm 47, I'm press biopic. The reason I'm saying this is because if I do not see anything right there on the screen, I'm going to point and the question is going to come to you guys. And I'm very mean, so anybody from Gangana will, you know, endorse that I'm very, very mean. So be sure that you are awake and yeah. So objectives. So we're going to discuss acute decompensated heart failure and uh, we will try to recognize and initiate early management because this is something, again, if you look at how the time things are there, we have 30 minutes, 45 minutes for acute decompensated heart failure. It is the initial hour, which is very, very important. We'll try to comprehend likely causes of pathophysiology of heart failure, appropriate diagnostic tests and manage the patient in ICU. That's what we try to do. So let's try to define. My topic is not about heart failure as such. It is about acute decompensation of heart failure. So as the definitions are becoming more and more philosophical, the way we used to define sepsis, SERS plus infection was very simple. Now you have, you know, all kind of thing. Similarly, they have slightly philosophized the definition of heart failure. It's a complex clinical syndrome, strange, with typical symptoms and signs that generally occur on exertion but they can also get at rest, just like a politician who is just trying to tick all the boxes. So if you are sitting in the room and coughing and, and you have precipitating factors, your chest is wet, you can have heart failure. If you are running a marathon, your chest becomes wet, you can have a heart failure. But the second part is far more important. It is secondary to an abnormality of cardiac structure or function. All right, so this is what defines it away from a viral fever, which is giving right to a wet chest. It has to be a structure or a functional abnormality, which will not allow the heart to fill with blood at normal pressures. Essentially speaking, although they have taken away pulmonary artery catheter, but they still they want you to realize the filling pressures are going to be high. So not pulmonary capillary blood pressure of 18 and all, that's not there. But yeah, essentially speaking, the philosophy remains there. And following the clinical diagnosis, you need to do an echo so that we can identify two kinds of heart failure. First is preserved left ventricle ejection fraction, which is 50% and more. Second is below 50%, which is heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. This is what I'm supposed to deal with. My patient with a poor heart, that means ejection fraction or heart ejection fraction is already low. And now they have come to you with acute heart failure. So quickly, this is what we have defined. And this part, which is the reduced ejection fraction, was earlier called systolic failure. Because essentially speaking, we assume that despite having high pressures, this is have this patient they have got nothing in terms of diastolic heart failure. While the other ones, essentially speaking, they have good ejection fraction, but heart is not able to accommodate blood because of diastolic failure. Alright? So what are the typical symptoms? I'm not going into atypical ones. These are typical symptoms. Most common presentation, remember, almost in 80% above patients is dyspnea, which has become now disproportional to what the patient is used to. Anybody who is in grade C onwards of heart failure would be dyspnea. But they will categorically tell you that the dyspnea this time, and they'll give you the time set most of the situations, is more as compared to what they usually have. Second is orthopnea. Obviously, they won't be able to lie flat. Parasim, nocturnal dyspnea, we know, and fatigue. Apart from dyspnea, which is unusual to them, this is most common complaint which brings them to either OPD or to your emergency department if it is combined with specific signs. For example, they will feel more congested, they will feel tachycardic, and obviously you will have, because, depending on the time of onset, you can have a little displaced apical beat. So, when we talk of pathophysiology of heart failure, I don't know how much of it is visible, but what we have to realize there can be consequences, which are direct consequences of heart failure. That means my cardiac chamber is getting dilated, the pump is becoming less and less effective, and it is not able to pump enough blood to end organs. All right. So ultimately, the, the cardiorenal syndrome or cardiopulmonary syndrome may develop. And obviously, when you have this kind of thing and heart is getting more and more directed, it becomes more and more arrhythmogenic. 
myocardium and any kind of ischemia or any such thing can precipitate further organ failures. But most of the times they achieve a unison, they reduce their activity, all right, and that's why their metabolic demands they go down and the failing pump is able to meet them till they decompensate. This is called decompensation of acute heart failure and this is the essential philosophy or pathophysiology behind it. Whenever, imagine I need to give 20 ml of blood, all right, I, in each stroke volume and my ejection fraction which was 50 percent that means if there was 40 ml of blood at the end of diastole I was able to pump 20 ml out of it if my ejection fraction is 50 percent now it has come down to 40 percent there is no other way except I increase my end diastolic volume so heart which was having 40 ml earlier in order to compensate for that 10 percent increases the end diastolic volume so it is a perpetually dilated and overfilled heart Anything which will lead to further vasoconstriction or changes in SVR or any reduction in this ejection fraction will propel more blood or increase the backward pressure, which is the venous pressure. That is why you see most of the times these patients have signs of venous congestion. It is not essentially volume overload in the vessels. It is your heart which is trying to have more blood so that he, he, it can pump more out of it in, in a reduced situation. So this is everybody knows one of the ways to define nowadays is, which still remains there for chronic congestive heart failure is NYHA classification let's come to today's topic again when we talk of acute heart failure they have defined it into three parts it can take many forms and it is a heterogeneous group so you can have a patient who has come to you with acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema most of the time these patients are hypertensive or normotensive because usually they be given uh, antihypertensive drugs, we try to maintain their blood pressure far lower. <coughs> they can be in cardiogenic shock, which has got a more than 40% cell mortality associated with it, or acute decompensated heart failure, which is the most common form of heart failure when they come to ED. <coughs> when we try to work, work them up, because by definition, signs and symptoms are not specific, still, we'll try to categorize them into all these three classes and we'll try to rule out one more thing which significantly happens as I'm saying right side of the heart is trying to have more blood into it anything which further precipitates any pressure on the right heart right heart has got thin wall all right it is not as muscular as the left side so chances of right heart failure in advanced decomposite heart failure are very high and it's a very different entity altogether so when we talk of decomposite heart failure there are certain causes and some of these causes are very important. One of them is acute myocardial ischemia. Any kind of ischemia which is which can be subnormal becomes abnormal for these patients. Second is infections and checking arrhythmias. So many times these patients they come to you with a low grade fever, with some cough. Actually speaking, any kind of viral infection can tilt their balance and they become decomposited heart failure and it becomes almost impossible for her to you know differentiate between them. This is a very typical problem. So many of the drugs, for example, somebody was having blood pressure which was not getting controlled, get introduced to calcium channel blockers or even poor control of sugars and some new generation anti-diabetic drugs which propounds to, again, retention of water and all can precipitate decomposite heart failure. So whenever any patients come to you, try to look at the drugs and the list is exhaustive. But some of them which are favorites of, you know, new generation physicians are this. Metazones and sesagliptin. They are very good in terms of their risk profile and adverse reaction, so they are getting more and more commonly prescribed. At times, these patients, they, 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 they are having other abnormalities, other diseases, so just go through the prescription and know what is happening there. A very common problem in India subsets is NSAIDs. Somebody gets a knee pain, gets prescribed shitloads of NSAID, third day down the line, patient is called the MN decomposite heart failure. It's a very common phenomena, we should be aware of it. Okay, so when these patients, they come to our casualty, particularly if there are signs of fever and all, we need to differentiate them first, obviously with myocardial infraction, because you can offer them PCI plus minus whatever treatment is available at your place, or you can refer them. Second is, confirm the AHF diagnosis. So, how would you confirm the diagnosis of AHF? Your patient has come to you with fever, maybe 99 degrees, breathlessness out of proportion to the usual breathlessness how would you confirm diagnosis in the casualty what kind of test you gonna run in the casualty okay what do you want to look in ECG 
You get exigent, everybody wants there to look. But what you want to look in ECG? Every investigation you're gonna do is gonna have some bearing on the management. So remember that. Think about the pre-test probability of what you are looking at ECG. We are doing ECG here to rule out any arrhythmia, all right? Particularly tachyarrhythmia, any fresh sign of ischemia. That's what we are doing ECG to. All right. Second thing. Anything? So I'm louder still. All right. So we want to do electrolytes. Definitely, we want to do hemoglobin for sure. Why? Because anemia or any sudden fall in hemoglobin can precipitate ischemia in them, hypoxia in them, and can <coughs> precipitate. So the treatment is going to be radically different from a patient, <coughs> perhaps who is having ischemia. Third, remember these patients are slightly old, and you can think of causes like hypothyroidism. Obviously, if that's going to come late to you, but before we give them any medication, we should perhaps send a thyroid profile in them as well. And anything else? BNP. Fantastic. BNP. How many hours does BNP take to come back if it is not point of care? I know some of us are working in the state of the art hospitals. You have a kid there, just put a you know, drop of blood, it gives you sugar, troparin, BNP, blah, 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 and more blah. But yeah, how many of you have point of care BNPs? Can you raise your hands? Oh my goodness. All right, great. So those of us who, who are going to get a BNP after four or five or maybe three hours, what's the significance of BNP? Can anybody tell me? <laughs> Fantastic. So again, we are talking of BNP as either confirmation or ruling out. All right. And some of the places, for example, particularly in infectious situations, if you are trying to rule out bacterial sepsis, they are sending markers of inflammation and pressure along the line. So there is a clear difference. We are BNP, troparin, ICD, and everything on you. And a few hours down the line, you can, you know, somehow have a comprehensive diagnosis. So we will just come down to the labels a bit, uh, very soon and start the treatment. Whenever you are running all these tests, try to have treatment running around side by side. All right. So what kind of treatment we have for uh, we acute heart failure? What is the first drug for acute heart failure? Okay, let's do it the other way. So first drug, uh, diuretic, raise your hands. If somebody says diuretic are the first line of treatment. <coughs> Two guys, all right. Vasodilators, I'm going to raise my hand up. Salt restriction, all right. So, and inotropes. From the crowd, only 10 people, they have raised their hands. So rest are still waiting for BNP. <laughs> Why your hands are not raised? Again, I'm asking. First line of treatment for heart failure is diuretic. How many of you agree with me? Please raise your hands. I'm going to point now. I told you I'm weak. Yeah. All right. First line of treatment is vasodilator. How many? Fantastic. First line of treatment is inotropes. How many? Some of them are having all the things as first line, which are right. They're cardiologists. You have no people standing here. You have great people that are in this. Cardiologists use all three drugs simultaneously. All right. So fantastic. This is a real life case. I have tweeted certain things. So, 64 year female, elective, she came for elective, totally replacement, injection session was 30% nitrate, aspirin, caprofil. <laughs> As always happens, God is so great and so are surgeons, there was no exceptional blood loss. Please read carefully, there was no exceptional blood loss. So, perhaps routine blood loss, I do not know what is routine for a surgeon. I mean, it can be, you know, entire yama can be read before they say it is routine. Hemoglobin 8.2, down from 10.8, still it was not exceptional blood loss. Uh, 1400 ml 12 hours, still everything is fine. Two pack cells, next six hours, leading the range stops. Day three, patient comes to us from post of ICU, starts to complain of dyspnea, all right. But as we got the over, they say this was what she came to us with. Blood pressure is 130 by 65, heart rate 140, bilateral traps, respiratory 24, SPO to 92%. So, what will you do first thing to this patient? Oxygen. 92% you want to give? So what is the threshold in you know, acute because of heart failure? Fantastic. Why I am here? Oh wow. So it is 94%. This is the exception. Acute decomposite heart failure. You target saturation of 94% and above rather than 92% and above. Alright. Anything else you want to do for this patient now? ECG? Okay, fantastic. This is sensory by anything else. No ischemia. Anything else? 
Chest X-ray? Okay. Coming. Anything else? Sorry? Hemoglobin. Hemoglobin? Ah, alright. So still 7.8. What do you want to look at ABG? Metabolic acidosis. Lactate is uh, 3.2. <coughs> How will a lactate change your management in acute decompensant heart failure? It will not. Eco, fan gases. We obviously we are sitting in the mitha of ultrasound. Vedantas. I'm wondering nobody said eco. Okay, what are you doing with eco? Sorry. I'm a pain. Fan acid. All wrong. So, as with ECG, we are looking for something which is the cause of decompensation. So, any acute vulvar abnormality <coughs> in ischemic patients, cardiac ischemia particularly, we are looking for any pre war rupture, any new MR, any new TR, or any acute right ventricular failure. Something which is causing decompensation, nothing else. Imagine somebody who has a of 38%. I don't know, W is not around perhaps, but. I am not sure from 38% to 32% can I actually predict that in a patient with having heart rate or zero? I don't know. So this is what you do echocardiography for. Fantastic. So before we do anything, we should go back to the history. What led to the compensation? Perhaps somebody upstairs gave injection diclofenac. Somebody pumps too much fluid into this patient. Or somebody forgets to introduce nitrates and vitamin for post-surgery. These are all possibilities which are lead to decompensation of heart failure in this patient. Remember them and try to reverse them rather than looking for causes which are, which are some fashionable and exotic. I have picked this up, but these are routine things. And obviously, we are trying to rule acute coronary syndrome out. Okay, so there are four key areas. Is my patient distinct? Oh, sorry. Oh, that's okay. Background, we know in this patient there is a background of reduced ejection fraction, so this is not a de novo kind of a thing. Does this patient has ACS? And, I mean, because obviously you can, not in this case, but perhaps you can offer them immediate PCI. And finally, what medication the patient is taking? All right. So when your patient comes with acute dyspnea, I'm, I'm sorry, this is slightly blurred. But what we can have, we can have a very simple algorithm on the basis of symptoms. We're not going to run any of the tests. Look, what is this patient needs? Does this patient needs immediate airway? Okay. Oh. Does this patient need immediate airway? If this patient, then give the airway. Otherwise, look at what is happening to your jugular vein. In any patient who is having congestive heart failure, signs of congestions are going to be there. That means perhaps this patient is having heart failure. But what else can be there in a patient who is admitted? You can have a tension pneumothorax or you can have a pericardial tamponade. All right. Remember these possibilities. And when you do echo, these are the things you are trying to rule out in this patient. Second, if there are rays more than one third of the chest, Pointing towards congestion, yes, yeah, definitely we are going towards heart failure. If it is no, hmm, let's look whether this patient is having some kind of wheezing or not. If patient is not having wheezing, come down, consider if there is any side or upper airway. If this patient is having clear lung field, obviously think of pulmonary embolism. So only by examination and brief history taking, in five minutes we can jot down to whether heart failure is most likely possibility in my patient, yes or no. All right. So we have already discussed this. These are these are the recommendations. These recommendations are from 2013 HA guidelines about acute heart failure. In 2017, they have updated one, which are about chronic heart failure. <coughs> but what this is what they say. Okay. Any other investigations we discuss, we will perhaps like to give anti pro BNP in these patients. So these are the cutoff values. If it is less than 100 <coughs> BNP or if it is less than 300 anti pro BNP, you are sure in a patient who is this neck and congested that this is not the cause. Heart failure is not the cause of this patient's dyspnea. Versus if you, for rest of the patients, you need to go by age. As the age goes high, your patient is needs to have higher level of anti pro BNP for him or her to qualify for acute decomposition heart failure. But there's two very important things. One is nowadays you are have ARNI, something which which is an inhibitor along with <coughs> ARB. 
and they reduce the level of BNP, but not anti-pro BNP because BNP is a substrate for them. So in those patients, particularly if they are obese and they are on ARNIs, you can have a falsely low BNP levels, not anti-pro BNP levels if you do them in acute situations. So remember this thing and send accordingly. In them, if you only have BNP, do not go by levels of BNP, go for anti-pro BNP. And BNP is 1A recommendation in any patient who comes with dyspnea and you need to do it not only for diagnosis but also for admission where you need to admit this patient and prognostication all right in ad there's a beautiful algorithm which says how you can put these patients on in icu or in the ward depending on symptoms and the levels of bnp so this is already discussed we can go further all right echo all right apart from valvular abnormality any other indication for that is if your patient is having hemodynamically unstable so what will you look for in a patient in echo if your patient is hemodynamically unstable and you think heart failure is a problem when we said tampon pulmonary embolism all right or right ventricular failure that, that, that's 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 actually the only conundrum if you are having a right ventricular failure and your patient is having a wet kind of a chest and you also suspect pulmonary embolism that's that's the only challenging part i mean but there are ways to do it that's just so this is again <coughs> recommendations you can have you can click them you will have the slides back so there is no to spend time over here oxygen therapy we have discussed so this is what we have done in 30 minutes patient is still the same respiratory rate has gone to 30 as you just went 92 percent heart rate and blood pressure what we do now what do you mean by NIV? Uh, what kind of non-invasive pressure? CPAP. Okay. How many want to give CPAP? I want to give CPAP. How many want to give bi-level? You still have people who want to give CPAP bi-level and then they raise their hands. Okay. What's the disadvantage of CPAP? All right. Remember one thing. Most of these patients are not volume overloaded all right they have very low intravascular volume they have been on diuretics for a very long time they are vasodilated with all kind of drugs so if you unnecessarily give high pressures that means even bi level in which inspiratory pressure is going to be high which is going to lead to your high intrathoracic pressure their blood pressure can come down you have to be very very careful so cpap is what is advocated if your patient remains tachypneic saturation does not improve despite oxygen that's the reason in these patients CPAP is rated higher over NIV in terms of offering them BiPAP and you offer them BiPAP if these patients they have a concomitant component of obstructive airway disease or they start to compromise their pH and retain CO2 but remember once your patient is compromising your CO2 and pH this patient is perhaps going to failure it's better to incubate this patient so what we did okay so this is what we have discussed it's a strong recommendation and these ones, when, when these kind of things are coming from uh, Australian acute heart rate guidelines, which came from 2018. All right, I, I have that thing at the end. So this is what you target, and okay, then you intubate these patients. So when we are treating these patients, this is what we are trying to achieve. We try to reduce the heart rate and ventricular afterload. Okay, as we discussed in our patient, we did not know when the beta blockers were withdrawn or when were the nitrates withdrawn or somebody with the doses of diuretics in them. So, diuretics. We said diuretics are the first treatment, but one thing we have to remember, they just improve the symptoms. Diuretics in acute heart failure, they have no mortality benefit. The reason we give them and perhaps is, what, what is the immediate effect of diuretics? What's the immediate effect of fusimide? It causes vasodilatation. Fantastic. It is a venodilator. It acts more as a venodilator. So that's why you see before your patient starts to pour urine, some of them they start to respond with to diuretic. The symptomatic response is primarily because of vasodilatation rather than anything else. That's why they say use if your patient is not on diuretics, use lowest dose of 20 to 40 mg of prusamide, depending on the blood pressure of the patient, and that will give you desired result. <coughs> All right. But what is more important is what they say. The guidelines, when you read in detail, they say they should not be given unless you have adequate perfusion and blood pressure is there. So you need to examine your patient, any patient who is obstructed, any patient who is having signs of peripheral vasoconstriction or peripheral perfusion deficit, they should not be given. <coughs> Sorry, 
diuretics. If your patient does not respond to diuretics because of any of these things or is not a candidate for diuretics, give them intravenous vasodilators. All right. So one and a half hours have passed. We have given first dose of diuretic. My patient is now on CPAP, and this is the situation. <coughs> what would you now? Okay, anotrope. How many anotropes? How many for vasopressors? How many would intubate? So those who are intubating, they're awake. Rest are sleeping. All right. So this patient is still, if you can see, crabs are worsening. That means his, or heart, sorry, heart congestive symptoms are worsening. Okay, we have given diuretics. We are giving enough positive pressure and congestion is worsening. So perhaps this is a time we'll like to intubate this patient. Okay, respiratory rate hasn't settled at all. Saturation is 95%, 6 cm of CPAP. So now we intubate. But we, alongside what we try to do is start a vasodilator dilator therapy. The cutoff value is 90 millimeters of mercury. Okay, can I ask? Um, please, I'm not, uh, I'm not a sexist, but how many of the women sitting here, they have a blood pressure, normal blood pressure of 90 and around? See, all right. So remember, in, in, in India, there are so many times we do not use this therapy because blood pressure is 70. Okay, in a disease situation, in a, in a typical Indian female, which is wrong. What is 90 there? Their normal blood pressure is perhaps 130, 140. So even if for 70 of blood pressure, we can safely use diuretics in Indian population. Some of them, if not all of them. So try to deviate from guidelines, try to imbibe guidelines in the local context. If you go to the Australia guidelines, they say in use in Australia only. For example, for consumption in particular situations, because the population, the mean blood pressure of populations are very different. So do not withhold therapy if your patient is having blood pressure of 70, but is talking to you. This patient is well perfused. All right. This patient deserves vasodilatation after a dose of diuretics. This is the most important thing. And there was one study which was done way back in 1999, and they combined on 90 blood pressure, high dose of nitrates, along with the lower doses of prosimide. If then they found rather than giving them high doses of diuretics and then going on nitrates is not the answer, but the first one. So you give them more of vasodilators and very low dose of diuretics and that's gonna perhaps get your patient better in terms of symptomatically. So this is what we tried and this is what my patient is. Okay? Any comments now? Better or worse? Fantastic. So what would you do now? Now everybody will intubate. But you see my patient is when you current well of urine. I'm a resident, uh, and you guys are consultant. And I say, why not give uh, further trial of diuretics? What's the harm? <laughs> Fantastic. Who said that? Octandid. Excellent. So now your patient is compromising. Whosoever said that is great. Whosoever looked at this, now patient is octandid. My perfusion, despite this blood pressure, is getting compromised, and my coronaries are getting compromised as well. So <coughs> perhaps I need to do that. So we intubate, and this is what happens. Oops. Here I go again. Yeah, I mean. So what we do now? What's the first one of therapy for this blood pressure? Sorry? Okay, sorry. Stop NTG how many? Inotropes? Excellent. Vasopressors? Fluids? Just, just tell me one thing, you were giving NTG and very conveniently everybody stopped NTG, but nobody wants to give fluid, which is so many of our fluids. Why can't you give fluids to them? So when we talk of optimization of preload, do not forget the possible rules of preload and preload and preload. Unless these patients are drowned in fluid by intensivists and perioperative caregivers, most of them, as I said and repeating myself, they are in they are in volume depleted mode. All right. And when we try to achieve these things, some of them, they, they go into this. Because the pulmonary edema is not the res result of excessive blood volume. It is the elevation of venous pressure and re reduction in forward pressure. So what the body was trying to do was to increase the end volume. You can give them eloquence of fluid of 250 ml and see how the blood pressure is behaving. 
okay and symmetrical blood pressure do not immediately stop your NTG bring the dose to half all right you can have a rebound fantastic so if, you, if you're aware of that do not do those things in practice this is what we did okay just keep giving them fluids and obviously few challenges should be dosed I'm not saying flood them in 500 ml give them 200 to 50 ml that's how you can take it because we know increasing the contractility is going to come at the expense of increasing in myocardial oxygen demand that's why inotropes if required they say if you do either scvo2 or some kind of cardiac output monitoring before you start them on inotropes or vasopressors all right so this is what we did this is the anaerobic therapy so we can have multiple options it is a weak recommendation if you see here it is a weak recommendation in patients who are having hypotension peripheral hypoperfusion and conjunction which is refractory to other therapy even inotropes are given in a patient with reduced heart failure to address congestion not to elevate your blood pressure we are not trying to target blood pressure at all here we look at signs of congestion and signs of hypoperfusion so now onwards that's why i asked what you're looking at the lactate you have a baseline lactate and you can keep looking at the lactate you have baseline scvo2 you can keep looking at the scvo2 if your patient is intubated you can look at the ECO to CAM. Look what is happening to your cardiac output. Look what is happening to your pressures, and that's how you time try. And there is strong recommendation against if your patient is not having any signs and symptoms of peripheral hypoperfusion and congestion. For example, in this patient in whom congestion has relieved after diuresing them, I will not start anotrope. I may leave them after giving 250 or 500 blood, uh, of volume. My blood pressure is back to 80, 85. I look at my lectures if things are improving. I go by the cardiac output. I will not start anotropes on them because there is evidence against them. Which anotropes? How many of us think this is the best anotrope? Because it has additional benefit if this patient was on beta blockers. It does not enter the nice effects of beta blocker. So, how many things do you done? Is good. Okay. So, it did not improve survival. It's a costly drug, so it came out. The choices remain between higher doses of dovitamine do or dopamine because as you give higher doses, your beta unis receptors, I mean, they are taken over by these new drugs, and this is what happens. And three to five days of infusion is considered safe. Milrinone, it is proarrhythmogenic, is not to be used in these patients at all. 18 hours. Patient is sedated, not much there. But if you see oxygen demand is going up, that means my congestion is still not getting relieved. All right, this is what you have to look for. And my perhaps I oscillate my chest, it is full. I look at the thing. So what do you do now? If you give peep, somebody said peep. We, we changed from dopamine to dopamine because patient was uh, was becoming more and more hypotensive. That's why we switched from dopamine to dopamine. Change to? Fantastic. Change to or add? Okay, we'll see. So, vasopressors, norepinephrine, high dose dopamine, and adrenaline. These are the options. All right. And they are used in patients with marked hypotension. And now, when we use vasopressors, they are used to increase blood pressure, not inotropes. Am I clear? Fantastic. Good. So, and who are not responding to ionotropic therapy with or without IV fluids. So, we try to maximize our cardiac output. We try to maximize our preload. And despite that, if my patient is not responding in terms of blood pressure, it is refractory, then I start vasopressors. Okay. Which one in cardiogenic shock out of these three? Good. So, this is a famous study in 2010. It says definitely, and this is a capital marker. If you go down in these patients who are in cardiogenic shock, even this one is not epinephrine better. 94 patients in each arm, perhaps. And this is, this is, is conclusive in cardiogenic shock, not epinephrine is better. 36 hours, now what? Dopamine 6, we came back because we started not epinephrine and we did not want to go to dopamine on high doses. So this is the situation. Again, FiO2 is worsening, PEEP is more, saturation is bad, output is coming down. What will you do now? Sorry? Okay, so we found this patient was given diclofenac, this patient was missing his nitrates, her hemoglobin came down from 10.2 to 7.8. In last two hours, she has received two more pexels, her hemoglobin is 9.8. Excellent. Those guys, 
who said this fantastic so this is what we have to remember 36 hours nobody asked me about cause i was about to these two guys have asked think of the cause so this is what led to decompensation we have reversed everything but now this patient has gone into organ failure okay what we do now so this patient is 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 option are just diuretic versus what can what, what else can be done for congestion fluid removal we are trying to remove fluid because this patient is on vasodilators this patient is receiving inotropes this patient is receiving as optimized oxygenation as possible so the option is to remove fluid or anything else okay let's let's stick to this part first so shall we use boluses of diuretics infusion of diuretics versus dialysis what's the ultrafiltration sorry not dialysis ultrafiltration how many said diuretics please how many diuretics how many ultrafiltration rest arresting <laughs> masterly inactivity is one of the best things that i see there's so many times when we do not do and patients survive and they, they give us a box of sweets and say you are the best doctor and some of us you know, just go, oh, no, i know what kind of doctor is okay whatever so ultrafiltration the thing is when they tried ultrafiltration before starting diuretics there were conflicting results and they started from 1998 to 2017 and nothing clear cut so ultrafiltration does not improve survival length of hospitalization but it is costly as compared to you know infusion of diuretics but one th has to remember if on presentation this is close to 2.5 milligram per dl of creatinine then the chances of reduced response to diuretics is going to be there that means you need to use either high doses and high doses plus infusion of diuretics if you are targeting do not start 0.5 milligram of fusamide infusion and then look at the catheter and ask in a very animated fashion with the nurse what it's not coming do not do that all right so they compared this is a beautiful study beautiful beautiful study again it, they looked at 96 hours what they were able to achieve and this is what they use look at this 40 milligram bolus if your patient was on diuretic but less than 80 milligram per day 40 milligram plus 5 milligram per hour any incremental dose it is exponential rise of prusamide 10 milligram 20 milligram 30 milligram per hour this is the kind of dose you're gonna need along with thiazide or it is alone all right so this is the kind of dose if you are trying to avoid ultra filtration you need to use really high dose and look at the unit output they are targeting close to three to five liters in a day so you should know the dosages and you should know what in indian population you can target 2.5 liters but if you think one liter a day that's just that's not going to solve the purpose okay and obviously look at how congestion is behaving and if you have weight bearing our daily being bats you are great so 38 hour down the line uh, we are still there 25 and my patient was in cardiogenic shock how many time at five minutes just five minutes so we did everything we put this patient on crrt and now this is the situation my patient is having what will you do now so the good people they 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 you know, anybody from generation of ambassador because i am have, have you seen ambassador being driven by normal people apart from you know the, the white one or the the blue one which which the army navy and politicians can use so ambassador was was made by hindustan motors it was very good car still find it very good great driving experience i mean plus to drive in those in those days we used to look for road in between potholes and, and ambassador used to you know Simply go through it, then came Impala. So, that was talking about Impala 2.5. Okay, this is, the, this is the device which is being used, and somehow it's killed IABP. And okay, so this is this is the principle we are trying to do all of these things. Perhaps we are trying to optimize preload, increase cardiac output, and we are trying to reduce afterload. And believe you me, if there is one device which is just all of this, is IABP. But when we put it to test, we are talking of ventricular assist device, but when we push it to test, okay, IABP did not improve outcome. <coughs> Alright, there was a meta-analysis, I, I forgot that meta-analysis because it's included just two studies, but there are two studies, the day the music died. You heard this song, right? Beautiful song, okay. So, this was the thing. First, in 2012, in JAMA, came this paper. 
IABP from myocardial infarction, but what they did, you know, if you look at this study, they gave either IABP or inotropes. It was not IABP given after inotropes. And as you look at Iloyolia trial, there were more than 30% crossover. So anybody who was more likely to benefit if you have a valvular abnormality, they were given INPP. And obviously, you know, th those patients will be in a much worse situation. And then the next year, Lensec came 12 months. Even after one year of IABP, I, I do not know why they did a one year survival kind of a thing. They all die. But as you grow old, you become either cynical, sinister, or you can become Sherlock Holmes. I, I don't have hair, so I'm not becoming him. But the same year this study they started was the same year when Impala got launched. 2013, Impala got launched. They started to study and beautiful results, if you can see, they started to come from Impala. So that's why perhaps IABP died. In our patient, we did use IABP. Okay, and these are the recommendations from EHA. We're going to get the slides, there is no need to click them. Do not think for go of general care. Septic complications are very, very common. So this is one subset. If you have slight or thought, try to at least cover for community acquired pneumonias and UTIs, some of these patients, they are not able to tell you the symptoms rightly. And tachycardias, and again, when you are having tachycardias, please, please, please look at the volume status of the patient. Try to fill them up before you give them any anti-arrhythmic drugs. Although they have vasodilatation that you want in these patients, but your blood pressure can come crushing if they are not having enough of preload in them. Okay, this is, again, this you're gonna, gonna get. Uh, you can look at the slides, it's just pretty much self-explanatory, but inotropic agents, again, is a 3A. Even in these situations, if your patient is having any kind of safety concerns, use them with caution, try to use more of vasodilators, optimization of preload, that's the thing. Again, you can have an algorithm of hypertensive A, acute decomposite heart failure, which is going to be self-explanatory. Some of these patients, they do, I mean, fall in a situation where you need to consider end of life care. And again, this is almost self-explanatory. I think we do not have, we're taking questions later, I suppose. So this is where I've taken most of the things from. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. So now we uh, break off for a tea break. Uh, people who want to join me to the ICU can join me now and come back and have a tea.